Welcome everybody. Um, thank you for attending. So for those who don't know me, I'm Eve Wagner. I'm a mediator and arbitrator at Signature Resolution. I'm also the chair of the Committee on Empowering Women and a member of the executive committee of the Beverly Hills Bar Association's Labor and Employment Section. Um, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel quickly since we have included everybody's CVs in the written materials that you should have received already. So on one side, we have um, Courtney and Ramit who exclusively represent employees and they've handled numerous pregnancy discrimination cases, including some recent trials. On the other side, we have Nora and Erica who exclusively represent employers um, and also have handled um, various trials, including I believe Erica, you defensed a pregnancy discrimination case fairly recently. I might also like to introduce Vandana um, she is a certified adult and pediatric psychiatrist. I mean, again, and feel free to refer to the written materials, which also include um, notices from the DFEH and the California Code of Regulations. The PowerPoint that we're going to use um, in a little bit will also be available after the program. So before we get started, I do want to just tell you a little bit about the Committee on Empowering Women. We established that in 2018, the Beverly Hills Bar Association that is. And we've done a wide variety of programs and we try and do them a little bit differently. Part of our mission on the Committee on Empowering Women is to bring both men and women into the equation because we believe that if everyone understands what the issues are, it will actually help everyone. Um, we've had a couple of interesting programs. We had one on sexual harassment and we starting from the little age, so when you're in kindergarten, elementary school, how to nip that behavior in the bud so you don't turn into a Harvey Weinstein. And then we had another program where we did sexual harassment from the male perspective, both what they can do to help women who are being harassed and also what it's like to be a male and be harassed. So in this seminar, we're gonna quickly go through the various laws that cover uh, pregnancy issues. Um, then we're going to have a presentation by Mandana about some of the psychological impacts, both why does this occur, why is it continuing to rise, and what is the impact when it does happen. And then we're going to go into more of a conversational mode where um, we're going to talk about trials and all kinds of other exciting issues. So with that, I'm going to start the PowerPoint, and I think, Nora, you are going to start that off. That is correct. Hi, everyone. Um... I'm glad that I'm here tonight to talk through these things. Um, we're going to go through an overview of the law, both in terms of the statutes, the regs that apply, and give you sort of a general overview. We're going to go through this somewhat quickly, so this should not be your only source. Um, you'll also have the presentation slides, but we wanna make sure that we're giving enough time for conversations about the psychological impacts and also um, a bit of a round table. So let's get started and talk about the um, laws and regulations in play. So first of all, we're going to have the Fair Employment and Housing Act, which should hopefully be familiar to all employees in California who are attending this seminar. We're going to be discussing the Pregnancy Disability Leave Law or PDLL and um, additional regulations. We're also going to be talking about the Family Medical Leave Act, which is the federal law and those regulations and how they intersect, intersect with California state laws. And we're also going to be talking about the California Family Rights Act. Um, I refer to this as CIFRA because we live in California. I'm sure um, other panelists will refer to it as CIFRA. We're talking about the same thing. So um, we'll also be discussing uh, disability specific regulations. Um, moving on, we're talking about these laws and who is eligible for what benefits and when. So for the Pregnancy Disability Leave Law and the Fair Employment and Housing Act, if an employer has five or more employees, the employees are covered and they're covered immediately. There's no measuring period or service requirement. For KIFRA, um, it's employers with five or more employees and that was expanded just in 2021. And this does have a year of service, um, 1,250 years, I'm sorry, 1,250 hours in the past year. The same um, applies to the FMLA. It's going to be employers with more than with 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius. But again, just like Kifra, you're going to have um, one year of service and 1,250 hours of service in that year. 
um, moving forward. This should all be very familiar to you because hopefully you've done trainings that are required that introduce you to the concepts of discrimination, harassment, and retaliation in the workplace. So during those trainings, I hope that you have some familiarity with protected categories and or protected characteristics under state law and federal law. Here in California, the, the protections are broader. There are more protected categories, so on and so forth. But relevant to our presentation tonight and our conversation is um, the Fair Employment and Housing Act defines sex to include pregnancy or medical conditions related to pregnancy, to include childbirth or medical um, conditions related to childbirth. And it also includes breastfeeding or medical conditions related to breastfeeding. Um, it's important also to note that while we're going to touch on harassment in some of these slides, the focus of today's presentation is discrimination. So harassment relates to, you know, what is the employee experiencing in their workplace? What, um, what comments, what statements, what kind of um, impact is that having on the employee and the ability to do their job? Discrimination, on the other hand, relates to the terms and conditions of employment. And so when we talk about pregnancy discrimination as a legal cause of action and as a legal term of art, um, it's important to be clear about what discrimination, it, unlawful discrimination is, and more importantly, what it is not. So if um, an individual employee files a lawsuit, what do they have to establish? They have to establish these six um, elements of their claim. So they have to establish that um, they are employed, that their employer is a covered entity, that an adverse employment action was taken against them. Um, what is an adverse employment action? It can be so many different things. So again, tying this back to terms and conditions of employment, that could be anything on the spectrum of the employment relationship from the decision to hire or not to termination, but it also covers everything in between. So it doesn't have to be a termination to give rise to a discrimination claim. It could be something like a terrible performance review, a demotion, so on and so forth. And it's going to be specific, specific and context-based on the facts of the individual employee. Um, then of course, the employee would have to show that they were harmed and that it was their employer's conduct that was a substantial factor in causing that harm. Um, this next slide relates to summary judgment standard. And I wanted to include this because we're talking about what an employee has to establish and the elements of unlawful discrimination and I think looking at it from the other side of most employers who are experiencing litigation, um, alleging pregnancy discrimination or discrimination generally are going to ask, how can we get summary, summary judgment? Is this a summary judgment case? Such that we can ask the court to decide as a matter of law, you know, here are all the facts, here's what happened, we didn't break the law. Um, and so this is really more for um, background and edification, but I wanted to drive home one point, which is in this, framework at the summary judgment stage, the employer does have to come forth with a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the adverse employment action. And um, something that relates to either performance or is completely um, separate from the circumstances surrounding the protections that the employee um, is covered by under the Fair Employment and Housing Act in this circumstance, pregnancy. So I wanted to have this slide, this slide here to flag that issue um, no adverse employment action should ever come as a surprise. And so if someone is pregnant, if someone is protected otherwise, it really doesn't matter. As um, a defender of employers and managers in this state, we always say and train that no adverse employment action should be a surprise, especially not a termination. And with that, I will turn it over to our next presenter. Hello, everyone. I'm Courtney Shigari and I represent employees. And I'm going to go through the slides regarding uh, pregnancy disability leave law. And under that, the employers must provide up to four months of disability leave due to any employee's pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical condition. And this can be for any reason that a, you know, a doctor effectively says that you know, someone needs to have some sort of time off or some sort of an accommodation for their job. And that could include, again, like it says in bullet point two, reasonably, reasonably accommodate employees with conditions related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. And under certain circumstances, transfer an, an employee that may need a transfer. So that may mean uh, an employee who's working, let's say, with paint, and their doctor determines that being exposed to paint while pregnant 
is something that could be a hazard to the baby. Or if someone is, you know, a reasonable accommodation obviously would be if someone is not able to sit uh, for long periods of time. So if they're a, an outside salesperson and they have to sit all day for driving, maybe that's not possible and, need, and they need an accommodation. Or some people, you know, who are pregnant may, you know, lose a child or they may, may be bedridden. So this could cover any of those types of different situations. And this is typically where, you know, in my view and in my practice where I see the problems begin is when an employee is asking for either some sort of an leave or an accommodation due to their pregnancy. And again, you know, what is being disabled by your pregnancy? That means someone is either unable to work or perform any one or more of the essential functions of her job. And, and or unable to perform these functions without undue risk to herself or the successful completion of her pregnancy or to other persons. So like I said, those a couple of examples with, of that would be either the pain example where someone where you know a woman would be exposing her unborn or unborn child to some sort of a hazard or um, un, being un, unable to perform any one of the essential functions of her job. I mean, if, if someone if a woman can't stand for long periods of time or needs an excessive number of breaks or is just completely unable to work if they're bedridden or they're, they are, um, if they've you know, had some sort of major complication due to their pregnancy, that all of those would qualify as being disabled by you know, her pregnancy. And again, uh, examples of these would be prenatal and postnatal care. And oftentimes this is depression, postpartum depression, or even depression could be depression during the pregnancy. I mean, it's really going to be up to the doctor to determine whether or not the person is disabled by their pregnancy, having severe morning sickness, gestational diabetes, um, you know, pregnancy induced hypertension, preeclampsia. These are all just small examples. Uh, I actually am handling a case right now. It's very funny that I'm doing these slides. Well, I mean, not funny, but I was in a handling a case today where my client had worked for 10 years for an employer and then she was laid off due to COVID, she got brought back and she became pregnant. And um, they, she told her employer, she says, okay, I'm, you know, I'm having these issues. I don't want to go into it, but my doctor basically said that I need to have some time off, you know, for my physical issues. And they said, okay, bring us the note. So she brought the note. And then they said, well, actually, you don't qualify for FMLA. They never even notified her about her pregnancy disability leave. And so as that is an option. And so that's a it's it's very this is an, an a benefit that not that all employees are not even aware of that they can that they that they have, you know, as an option. And so um there's a bunch of different examples of what would qualify. And then the notice requirements, this falls into right this slide, where the employers must provide advance written notice of the rights and responsibilities by either posting it in a conspicuous place where all the employees would see, uh, putting it in their handbook. Oftentimes that's you know the best place to have it, like how we said here, number three, providing it to an employee who informs them of their, their pregnancy. So for example, in the case that I'm handling right now, when when the employer was notified, when my client informed the, the employer about her pregnancy, the appropriate time was at that point to say, listen, you're able to take pregnancy disability leave, here are your rights, here's the situation, here's how much time you can take, you know, let us know what it is that you need. And again, it says here that, you know, this must be translated into any language and um, there are pregnancy regulations and the DFH provides templates, which we're gonna, which is in the next slide. So the employees are able to realize all of the rights that they that they have. This you know this slide goes through all of the different obligations that the employer has, which is to obviously reasonably um, accommodate the employee, provide them with up to four months of the pregnancy dis disability leave, pr provide them with break times, and so on and so forth. And then. Uh, it's what's important to note is that, and I think we're going to go through this in the other slides, is just that, you know, this pregnancy disability leave doesn't have to be taken all at one time. It can be intermittent. And again, there's no set amount of time that the employee had to work at that place in order to be able to receive that type of leave. So good evening, everyone. My name is Erica Shao. Uh, I represent employers exclusively, and I'm going to go over the next few slides. Uh, which is about accommodations. So the first is requesting accommodations. 
and these will vary. Uh, you can uh, have a lot of accommodations and they include lots of things like modifying the work practices or policies, modifying work duties, modifying schedules to permit coming in later, coming in earlier, leaving later, frequent breaks, uh, providing furniture is a frequent one. You see a lot of requests for a standing desk, ergonomic keyboard, ergonomic mouse, uh, modifying equipment or devices. Uh, sometimes you have, uh, I think it's called um, dictation software, if there are issues with carpal tunnel, providing reasonable amount of break time, use of a room uh, or location in, pro in close proximity to provide for lactation breaks. So essentially employers really do have to engage in this good faith interactive process because there's no undue hardship defense. The assumption is that accommodations are de minimis for employers and an employer must also re respond to a request as soon as practicable. And that's really no later than 10 days after receiving the request. Employers uh, can use its own form, healthcare providers form, or a form in regulations to request a medical certification. They must notify employees of the need for certification, the deadline, and the consequences of not providing the certification. Usually that comes in a formal letter form that gets mailed, emailed, transmitted uh, by multiple means these days. And then the employee must have at least 15 calendar days to return the certification to the employer. The content of the certification, the employer can ask for certain things, a description of the accommodation or transfer requested, the date the accommodation or transfer uh, become, became necessary, the expected duration of the accommodation or transfer, and confirmation that that transfer accommodation is needed due to the pregnancy. Hi hey everyone, I'm Ramit Mizrahi, plaintiff side lawyer. So um, I'm gonna be speaking to you about the different uh, leave time calculations and how we get there. Um, before I do that, I wanna tell you that I think that at least half of the mistakes that I see employers make could have been prevented if they had read the implementing regulations for both the Pregnancy Disability Leave Law and the California Family Rights Act and throw in the disability uh, regulations as well, right? The Fair Employment and Housing Council has um, implemented these regulations um, or promulgated them and and they really take you through the weeds and the details. Um, and, and specifically when you're dealing with leave laws and accommodations, they're essential. So in terms of uh, pregnancy disability leave PDL, um, it's four months, which some people would just assume is 16 weeks, but it's not. It's 17 and a third weeks. Um, it's four months per pregnancy, not per year. Who knew? The regs. Um, intermittent leave is permitted, um, and it has to be accounted for in the shortest time period that's used by employers for other leaves or one hour, whichever is less. Um, and again, intermittent leave can be used for things like doctor's visits. The employee has an obligation to make reasonable efforts to schedule it so as not to um, disrupt the business, right, what they can do. Um, and during that time frame, an employer can transfer an employee on intermittent pregnancy disability leave to alternative positions. Um, you look at the number of hours um, that they work within that four month period to figure out what they're entitled to. Um, California Family Rights Act, I say CIFRA, I've heard CIFRA as well. So we have three competing pronunciations, go with the one you like best. Um, and so again, that provides for 12 weeks of job protected leave with the continuation of healthcare coverage. Um, the categories have been gone through. I do want to flag for you that CIFRA was recently expanded, right, two years ago and then again last year, to allow for caregiving for different familial relationships that weren't covered before, right? So now it also includes, um, you know, in addition to young child, adult child, um, grandparents, grandchildren, siblings, in-laws of all kinds, um, domestic partners and their children. Um, the expansion is really wonderful. I will say a little bit more about that later. Um, and the basic um, minimum duration of a CIFRA leave is two weeks when the leave is taken for the birth adoption or foster care placement of a child. But an employer has to grant a CIFRA leave of less than two week duration on any two occasions. 
So when we calculate this, these leaves, I like to say that I really don't care about the FMLA. I've never filed an FMLA claim in my life. It doesn't exist in my life. I file state law claims in state court. Um, but basically you look at these laws and for each law, you know, FIHA, PDL, FMLA, CIFRA, you, you look at them and you see their interplay. Um, and other than um, PDL and CIFRA, which are um, consecutive, all the others are essentially concurrent. And again, PDL and CIFR can be taken intermittently. Um, so let's look at a really nice slide. So this slide is really a, um, a screenshot from a, a Know Your Rights brochure created by the California Work and Family Coalition, which is meant for non-lawyers. It's meant for people to figure out what their entitlement is. Um, and one of the things that's very nice about it is it, it shows you all the moving parts and pieces as one is looking at protected leave. So the top part of it is job protection, right? It's the employer obligations, the employee rights with their respect to their jobs. And the bottom part is wage replacement, which is really through the government, right? State disability insurance and then paid family leave, PFL. Um, and so when you look at it, um, you're looking at you know, pregnancy disability leave, generally speaking, six weeks uh, in advance, uh, or sorry, four weeks before um, uh, the baby is due is usually considered a disability period in addition to all of the other time that, that um, mom might need for prenatal visits, morning sickness, and all the other ailments that um, can sometimes plague uh, pregnant women. Um, a healthy uh, vaginal delivery is usually considered a six-week disability period after eight weeks for a C-section, more if there are complications. I see a lot of things like postpartum depression, anxiety. Sometimes there's other physical challenges uh, with a complicated birth. And once that disability time is up, right, it's up to four months, but it's really case specific. Then you have the CIFRA time that kicks in and it's up to 12 weeks. Um, doesn't, you know, mom doesn't matter whether mom still or isn't still disabled once the, um, you know, either at the expiration of four months or once her disability period ends, in comes the CIFRA. And again, the FMLA period just sort of ran concurrently all along. Um, and on the state disability insurance front, it sort of, uh, you know, it runs within a similar time frame, um, and then it kicks over to the paid family leave when, when we're out of the disability zone and into the baby bonding period. Um, in the last few years, time seems to move quickly, but the paid family leave window of time um, was expanded from six to eight weeks and wa the wage replacement percentage went up from about 55% to the 60 or 70% in hopes to allow more people to be able to take that time off to bond with their kids. So we have a couple of examples. I don't wanna spend too much time on it, but um, example one, a woman's disabled by pregnancy um, and she begins a pregnancy disability leave eight weeks before her child is born and then has a C-section delivery. So um, the FMLA period would begin at the outset and expire 12 weeks after her leave starts. She would still be disabled. PDL would begin at the start of the leave and end eight weeks after the C-section delivery, barring further complications. Um, she took six, 16 weeks of pregnancy disability leave and then she pivots over to the CIFRA leave, which would either be the 12 full weeks or she can choose to take some or all of that time immediately and reserve some of, or all of it till, um, you know, with to be used within the baby's first year of life um, for other or for other covered purposes. Um, second example. Um, so, um, and I want to note, by the way, that interestingly in the regs, this was like a reminder because I hadn't read the regs in a while, that technically if a woman uses up all of her pregnancy disability leave and the baby still hasn't been born, the employer can use can start the clock ticking on CIFRA um, as a reasonable accommodation because CIFRA explicitly excludes um, pregnancy related conditions from its definition. But I've always ever seen employers do that. It wouldn't make sense to use a, a FIHA disability accommodation and kick in CIFRA. Um, okay, example number two, um, you have a pregnant woman who's put on bed rest early in her second trimester. Um, so again, this is sort of the interplay, right? You have the FMLA leave, it starts at the outset, runs, expires at the 12 week mark. PDL would begin at the beginning, run for the four months. CIFRA at that point would be in play. Um, next slide, but wait, there's more. 
um, a lot of the times people just do this math and they say, you know, 17 and the third weeks plus 12, and that's the end of the job protected leave. Or in the in the old days, um, you know, two years ago before CIFRA um, applied to employers with five or more employees, they would say, up, oh, your four months are up goodbye. Now you, you need, that's it. That's all, that's all your job protection. However, if the mom is still disabled at the expiration of her PDL and CIFRA time, leave as a reasonable accommodation still must be considered. Um, she's entitled to it other than, um, you know, if an undue hardship can be established. So don't forget about that. Um, and with that, I turn it over to our next presenter. It's me again. Um, just two slides more about um, just sort of closing the loop on job protection and insurance. So under the PDLL, um, reinstatement to the same position is required if that position was eliminated for a reason unrelated um, to the employee's leave than a comparable position. Um, under KIFRA and FMLA, reinstatement to the same or comparable position what are you looking at when you try to determine if it's the same or comparable? Um, look at things like pay, benefits, working conditions, duties and responsibilities, skill set, those types of things. There's no bright line rule. This is comparable, this isn't. It's going to be a context based analysis. Um, as far as insurance is concerned, um, that's going to be maintained for a four month um, plus 12 weeks, is the potential total coverage. Um, it's maintained throughout the pregnancy disability leave and um, KIFRA leave as an obligation. It's not one of those scenarios where the employee has to pay the premiums. So um, with that, our next presenter is. I'm going to yeah, I'm going to finish up um, a little bit about pay while on PDL. So use of vacation time and PTO. Uh, this is the employee's option only. Uh, utilization of sick time, the employer can require use of and the employee may elect to use accrued paid sick time while on PDL. Pay while on CIFRA leave, uh, the use of vacation time and PTO, so the employer can require use of and the employee may elect to use accrued vacation and PTO. Sick time, the employer can require use of accrued paid sick time only for the employee's own condition. The employer or employee can mutually agree to use accrued paid sick time for other reasons. All right, so with that, we're gonna to turn to the next phase of the program and talk about, whoops, we had one more apparently. There's one final slide, I think. It's just paid oh, leave through. It's okay, uh, it's just a paid leave through EDD. Uh, paid, you know, I think we, touched upon this already briefly. So as in a summary, you know, paid disability leave, when you can take it before birth, there's particular timeframes for after childbirth and then paid family leave, uh, it's eight weeks and that's available for both moms and dads. Okay. All right, now we're gonna turn this over to Mandana to talk about the psychological impacts of pregnancy discrimination. Um, and then we'll open this to a more conversational approach. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Andana Tarabi. Um, I'll be discussing um, the psychological aspects of pregnancy discrimination. Um, the points I'll be going over are societal perceptions of women during the peripartum period in the work area, in the area of work, understanding perceived discrimination, common mood symptoms that are present during the peripartum period, the link between how discrimination can exacerbate mood symptoms and potential solutions. Okay. Now, the ideal American employee is one who's um, viewed as um, an ambitious, competent, autom autonomous worker, constantly available at all times and willing to work. And studies have shown that these traits are not, not often associated with uh, working women. And research shows that pregnant women are all often perceived as being less competent, more needing of accommodation, and less committed to work compared to women who don't have children. Um, additionally, studies have shown that employers view pregnant women as a liability in the workforce um, that causes undue stress to the employer, and they're, again, they're perceived as being less driven and incompetent. 
Um, the definition of pregnancy discrimination is treating a woman, an applicant, or an employee unfavorably because of pregnancy, childbirth, or a medical condition related to the pregnancy or childbirth. And examples of that would be that we've talked about earlier, refusal to hire, terminate, changing performance expectations, harassment, intrusive comments. Now, benevolent sexism is um, a term that's very well studied, and it's it's something that one does in, in a work environment that's often well-intentioned with um, um, such as lightening a, the workload, unsolicited help or advice, and trying to do the work for the woman. And often what studies have shown is that actually makes women feel less competent in their profession. And one of the reasons women leave the workforce or their career. Um, the perinatal period in the lifespan of a woman, um, of, for a woman is a critical period psychiatrically. That's when you do see a lot of mood symptoms for various reasons. Um, the most common reason being this biological shift, the hormonal shift that's happening. But this is also a period that is emotional, there are financial components, social changes that are happening during this period. Um, and all of these stressors really result in an increased risk for mental health problems. The mental health problems I'll be focusing on in this talk are anxiety and depression because they are more prevalent during this time. Um, and um, specifically depression uh, affects one in seven women um, in the perinatal period. And two thirds of those women who are depressed also have comorbid anxiety disorder. The prevalence of major depressive disorder in the postpartum period can range from 8.9% in pregnant women to 37% at any point um, up to one year after uh, pregnancy um, or delivery. Uh, the most concerning um, statistic is that suicide accounts for 20% of postpartum deaths and self-harm, whether that is with suicidal intent or without, um, during pregnancy in the postpartum period can range anywhere from 5 to 14%. Now, we often focus on the mother um, and how stressors can exacerbate anxiety and depression. What's not spoken about is the fetal and the infant effects. So it is well established that maternal depression, anxiety, does lead to adverse effects of the infant. And um, such as um, those co adverse consequences are preterm birth, lower birth weights, higher rates of miscarriages. And if you just, um, a mom who is depressed or an anxious can't really uh, um, be as present with their child and resonate with their child. And for that reason, you'll see greater deficits in verbal, social skills, emotional development, cognitive development, Additionally, a mom who is depressed is not going to be seeking as much health services, such as pediatric visits or vac keeping up with vaccinations or other medical treatment. Okay, now um, any form of stressor during the peripartum period can exacerbate anxiety and depression. Perceived discrimination is considered a significant stressor. And for that reason, uh, perceived discrimination has been linked to increased levels of depression, anxiety during this time. Um, because perceived discrimination does trigger negative emotions that contribute to poor uh, overall mental health wellness. Um, and there is a stigma with women when it comes to discrimination in the workforce. And um, when that, um, that experience, A, is not often spoken about, it can't be validated. For that reason, women don't seek treatment. So these women are often suffering without um, getting mental health treatment. Okay. And as I um, mentioned earlier, the fetal infant effects that are present when a woman is diagnosed uh, with depression or anxiety during the peripartum period, perceived discrimination elevates the chance of anxiety and depression. For that reason, it has been correlated with um, preterm births, um, uh, lower APGAR scores. APGAR score is a rating that's done uh, when, uh, when on a newborn uh, on a scale of one to 10, and it's the overall healthness of a newborn is evaluated. Women who are discriminated against, um, their infants usually have lower APGAR scores and lower birth weights. Okay, now, um, the strategies for reducing discrimination. Now, US is far behind most industrialized nations when it comes to formal policies. So policies is definitely an area that there should be focus on, um, whether that's paid or extended maternity leave. And um, the critical one being 
mandatory paternity leave for two reasons, because what that does, it, um, it neutralizes caregiving within the home, um, such that it's the responsibility of both parents, and it reduces the work stigma that comes with family commitments. Um, additionally, flexible work hours, locations, breastfeeding, pumping, having a uh, lactation room, flexible hours. And um, I, you know, there are many different studies that look at strategies and the most um, significant strategy has been when an organization or supervisor is very open and accepting of families and it's openly discussed prior to any pregnancy. Um, then that's critical for a few reasons. A, women are more comfortable going to their supervisors early on discussing their plan for their pregnancy. Um, and it also allows a discussion uh, for women to have a discussion about what does it look like when I do come back to work. And the reason that's important is because the um, women tend to leave the, um, their jobs or their careers because the expectation they have uh, about what it'll look like when they return, whether that is how often I can take time to go to a pediatric visit, uh, my child's sick, I have to stay home. When that expectation is not met, um, women, um, women tend to leave the workforce, um, the rate is much higher. Um, and that's it. And in conclusion, I just, um, you know, the, I think what the focus is, it, it is, it is important, um, the experience that the mom has, but I think what's often missed in these discussions, from a psychiatric perspective, even is um, uh, that the effect that it has on the fetus and the infant, which is critical and really important to address. All right, so one of the things I wanted to talk about is what can be done to change these stereotypes and biases in the workforce and, and why are cases, pregnancy discrimination cases on the rise? So take it away, someone. Well, I think we can look at what, um, I, I think a good model and a good place to start is um, examples of employers getting it right. What are the circumstances and culture um, changes that help women in the workforce feel comfortable to disclose their pregnancy, feel supported throughout their pregnancy, and feel confident returning to work that they will be able to perform their same job functions and um, be welcomed back, you know, wholeheartedly when they decide to return to work such that they will stay in the workforce. Um, I think that um, in my experience in defending these claims and more importantly in my role as a trainer and educator for employers, is really taking a minute to look at things like, what is the paternity policy, paternity leave policy? Are men taking paternity leave? If you have a culture where men take paternity leave as well as women, and it's not just the female workforce who take the leave of absence with the birth of a young child, then it kind of helps stabilize that equation. And that, in my experience, undercuts any stigma attached to taking leave of absence and time off. And I, I can jump in. So I think that when, when we, I guess first, why are we seeing this on the rise? I mean, I think that COVID has certainly not been a help. Um, and it's not been a help because the caregiving basically that, that used to be uh, outsourced to schools and daycares and nannies um, collapsed, that system collapsed during COVID, right? A lot of uh, early childhood education centers closed, schools were working remotely. You had parents who are working parents who suddenly had to be sitting there supervising little people um, while they were trying to do their jobs. And I think then that the stakes of being a parent got that much higher. Um, and unfortunately, you know, pregnancy discrimination hurts all women in the workplace. All women, whether they're pregnant or not, women who are of childbearing age, which is, you know, two decades of someone's career where they're future potential pregnant people. Um, and, um, you know, particularly in industries where there isn't a norm of, um, you know, people having children, taking time off to do that, you know, having their job protected, returning. Um, I think these situations tend to be more amplified, whether it's fields where there's a gender imbalance, where there aren't as many women in the workplace to, to, to do this, um, you know, in fields that skew young, like tech, where, um, you know, there might be a culture of, you know, working 17 hours a day and really bragging about that. Um, but in terms of change, 
I think that we need to look at it at different levels, right? So uh, at the individual level, at the workplace policy level, and then at the societal, right? At the, at the legislative level, at the societal level, because I think that changes can be implemented at each of those levels, right? So big picture societal level, there's been a lot of work over the last decade to um, enhance uh, people taking time off and, and using, for example, leave rights. So things like um, figuring out why don't people do it, right? So why weren't people use, utilizing their leave rights? Number one, people don't know what their leave rights are. There was research that found that something like two thirds of workers know about the FMLA, which means a third don't know about it at all. And FMLA is the household word. So if they don't know about the FMLA, they probably don't know about PDL and CIFRA and how those things interact. Um, people weren't taking it because they needed the money, right? If the, pay, if the leave is not sufficiently paid, they might not take it because most people can't afford to go without a paycheck for an extended period of time or a wage replacement that's not high enough. Um, a lot of people empirically were shown not to take that leave because they were scared of retaliation, particularly men, right? Um, there was some data, this is 10 years old, but you know, not much has changed with respect to the pay gap and things like this, where 85% um, of new dads uh, were taking um, some leave after the birth of their child, but only one to two weeks on average. Well, in California with paid family leave, that doubled it to about four weeks, which is nice, but still not great. Um, so those are some sort of policy changes that I think have been worked on, um, you know, whether it's education, more pay, uh, you know, retaliation protections, expansion of job protections in terms of the CIFRA, things like that. Um, at an organizational level, um, you know, as Nora was saying, it is, training, the right kind of training, um, its policies and showing that leave and, you know, parenting, caregiving, leave, all of that matters, which is things like some companies that have paid parental leave that goes beyond just getting some, you know, minimal wage replacement through EDD. Um, and I think that leadership matters, right? If you're seeing upper management caregive, take time off, and workers are going to feel much safer um, doing that. So I have more to say, but I'm going to let some other people jump in. But let me ask, um, Mandana, I mean, do, do you see in your practice ways um, to help at a young age get people to understand, you know, so that these stereotypes don't keep persisting? Yeah. So one of the interesting um, things that's come up, and so if any woman who's pregnant goes to a um, uh, obst obstetrician follow-up, there's a depression scale that's done. And then postpartum and the pediatrician and the obstetrician do a lot of edge psycho educating actually. Um, and there's, there's a lot of research out now that's suggesting that part of that should be for women who work that discrimination is far more common. And um, that can result in mood symptoms, whether it's anxiety or depression. And just validating that this is an actual um, discrimination is happening can then empower women to go to their employee, discuss um, um, plans for leave. What will it look like when I come back? Um, so that, that's been shown to be really, uh, in studies that have done that, it's been helpful for women to be able to process it before, um, before they take leave. And are you seeing uh, any change in, in the stereotypes of um, and anybody, you know, those who are advising employers or people who are uh, having clients come to them to sue their company? Um, have we seen any changes in terms of the fear of saying, you know, this is the greatest time of my life. I'm pregnant, but oh my God, I don't want to go tell my boss because now I'm not going to get that great assignment that I thought I was going to get in a week those kinds of things, is it getting better? Or is the perception that this is the same as it was when I was young? Well, I, I can just speak. I have, so I was pregnant in the last couple of years and I was out on my own at that point, but I remember feeling, well, first of all, when I was pregnant, I didn't feel like myself. I mean, I wasn't 
myself. I didn't mentally feel like myself. I was foggy. I, you know, you have all your doctor's appointments. I mean, there's a whole host of things that you physically go through as a, during that time. And I remember thinking to myself and talking to my partner and saying, God, I can only imagine how someone must feel if they work for someone. They've got, they've got a whole host of doctor's appointments. You've got to, you know, you have testing you have to do. I mean, there's a million different things. It's like another mini job. All of a sudden you're moonlighting as a, as a pregnant woman. And what I, what I was able to do as a result of that is relate a little bit more to my clients who I've, I've noticed really expressed to me how difficult it is to come out and even tell their employers that they're pregnant, even just not even asking for anything. I mean, just, just to say, listen, I'm pregnant. I'm due in April. I've noticed that it's, it's become even more, I feel, I don't know if it's COVID. I don't know if it's the, the already high level of anxiety that we're experiencing. And now this is just adding an additional stressor onto an already stressful life. For example, I have an, a, a case right now. Now it's in, it's in the Central Valley. It's not in you know Los Angeles, but I have a case right now where my client worked with an, you know, her boss at a different you know, employer and witnessed her discriminate against other pregnant employees, you know, make comments about them behind their back. She then became pregnant at the second employer that they worked at together. And she was absolutely terrified to express that she was pregnant. And she didn't even ask, she wasn't asking for anything at that time. And of course she was ultimately, um, you know, a, her boss made a bunch of comments towards her and overlooked her for a potential, um, um, what's the word, um, promotions. She wasn't able to get her, uh, her pay increase that she asked for. A man who had just been there for two months got the job that she wanted. I mean, there was, so I think that even though I th we're going in the right direction and there are companies like Nora said that are absolutely doing it right. And I think that are informing their employees, their they are promoting family. They're promoting a healthier environment where you know people can take time off if they want and invest in their personal lives, and they're not going to be punished for doing so. I think that it's still out there that that like for example, in this case, the the my my client supervisor had children, and so and maybe sometimes that's that doesn't help because maybe then the you know the person knows the all of the negatives or all of the um, challenges that the woman is facing and, and thinks to themselves, well, they're not going to be able to focus on their job with all of these other things going on. So it's hard to know it, you know, if someone, if, if that is necessarily the fix, but I do agree with Ramit when she said that notice that notifying the employees of their rights is really critical. Almost all of my clients don't get their rights correct. They, they don't even know what they were supposed to be asking for. So how can they ask for something and how can they, you know, how can they even know what happened is wrong or, or illegal and in what, in what sense, if they, if they're just uninformed. So, so I think Nora, that's a big problem. Sorry, sorry, Nora, I know that you did corporate trainings while you were pregnant and that gave you a different insight into real training versus the we have to do this training. You've got to have two hours in order to meet our compliance deadline. So can you talk a little bit about what companies can be doing and what a real training looks like? Sure. So I do these trainings across Southern California, and I think that there's a real concrete benefit to an in-person training with someone who has sufficient knowledge and background, and it could be a lawyer, it could be a human resources um, representative, but who has sufficient knowledge in the, the legal standards, the different terms, um, to not just introduce the terms and concepts, but to actually apply them. So when I do these trainings, I try not to pick on any particular protected category unless I'm a member of that category. And so um, uh, when I was very pregnant, I was doing, um, I was like probably at about nine months, um, I was doing uh, presentations to various corporate um, audiences. And because I was so pregnant and so sweaty, I could make comments and open up dialogue about what does it mean that I'm standing up here? Um, what does it mean to learn? How does it feel to announce your pregnancy? What are we doing for pregnant women in terms of, are we welcoming them, welcoming the news with joy, right? Are we welcoming them um, to discuss their leave and their plan well in advance such that no one is surprised. 
Because if you have a culture where employees don't feel confident and safe, frankly, to um, communicate about not just pregnancy, but really any medical condition, that hinders the ability to have a concrete plan in place for them to go on leave and have um, operations be relatively seamless. So the more your culture drives home that this is something shameful or something to be um, not discussed and not out in the open, the more problems you're going to have. If you have management and supervisors in particular sitting at a computer screen and just pressing next or wiggling their mouse enough to look interactive, that is a problem. What I find is um, a few jokes, a few comments, and then really opening up the floor to dialogue and communication and saying, okay, here's the legal standard, but here's some tools to be proactive to prevent this from happening in the first place. If you see this, um, if you see a pregnant woman, do you assume that she's disabled just because she's pregnant? I'm standing in front of you at almost nine months pregnant and I'm going to stand up here for two hours and I tell you, I am fine. I don't need you to reduce the length of this presentation. I don't need a chair, I'm fine. And it should be for the woman who is pregnant or the individual with a medical condition to raise their hand and raise that flag to point out um, what was previously discussed about like benevolent intentions are not always received that way because it does impair your sense that you are capable even with a medical conditioning with a pregnancy to perform every aspect of your job. So I cannot underscore enough how important it is to have that dialogue and to have it in in-person space where the managers are together and have to look each other in the eye and grapple with these really kind of uncomfortable questions in a place where they feel they can ask questions, learn information, and then most importantly, review their own conduct. So the hours, the, the hours spent training, the conversation that we're limited to two hours, we have a lot to, to cover in those two hours, discrimination, harassment, retaliation, abusive conduct, how to receive complaints. I mean, there's so much to cover, but one of the things that I really find helpful is emphasizing an audit of your own behavior. Has someone come to you recently and disclosed that they're pregnant? How did you react? Did you, rea did you react with joy or did you emphasize immediately what an inconvenience this is going to cause? How are you communicating about other employees who take advantage of, of paternity leave or the full maternity leave? What is the culture that the company is wanting to communicate and to establish amongst all of its workforce, which um, I don't recall who said it now, but which does start at the management level. Um, so if you have a manager, if you have a supervisor here in a law firm, if you have an equity partner who gets pregnant and is like, I'm out guys, PTO, prepare the others. Um, <laughs> there is a culture and a conversation of like, okay, this is a leader who's taking their full leave and maximizing all of their benefits because we are employees, but we are so much more. Um, and recognizing that sort of humanity and need, I think is just indispensable and such a tool to have uncomfortable conversations between coworkers to do better and be better. And Erica, from your perspective, any add-ons to that or, you know? No, I completely agree with what Nora said, because I was just going to say, you know, I think adding to that a little bit because of COVID and because we've done everything remotely uh, virtually and there seems to be an ease of doing these things uh, via webinar and many companies have that you know I represent very large organizations where it is easy to just send an email blast of a two-hour webinar that you have to take but I do find the importance of having these conversations also in person and and having someone present and going through scenarios because that's the only way that you're going to have to address these difficult topics. And it's easy to click on a mouse. And you know, I I have present, you know, I have webinars, I do it too. But I think that in, in what we do as a practice, it's unique. I have a unique set of circumstances to be better at that webinar, um, hopefully than most. But when you're confronted again with your peers and to discuss these topics. That's the only way we're gonna get better. That's the only way they're gonna get better. And I think they are. I think, you know, with, with everyone and everything that's happened and becoming more cognizant with people's uh, different perspectives, I, I think it invites conversation and I think that invites more understanding. So one thing I hear in some of the mediations um, on the defense side is, 
you know, we're basically damned if we do, damned if we don't. If we say, oh, geez, you know, um, if we try and be helpful, then we're being uh, condescending and demeaning and we're not being respectful. And then if we don't do anything, then we're not understanding. And so a lot of employers don't know how to walk that line and when they're supposed to reach out and say, do you need an accommodation or whether they wait for the employee to come. So what do you think about those kinds of concerns? I think those concerns exist because the conversation isn't being had. So there, there isn't an understanding of how a woman wants to approach her work when she comes back. Um, or the expectation of the uh, of you know that they have of her when she returns. So when that conversation isn't had, I think it it does feel confusing and vague and um, sort of how do we predict? It's 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 sort of a guessing game of predicting <laughs> what it looks like. And if that if um, if the organization um, before like I mentioned in my talk before pregnancy and when you hire someone and this is clearly stated that these are our policies we want you to come to us you want to have an open discussion about these things engage where you are and what we expect um, I think that would make um, that would that discussion would make it less complex um, yeah. I think that the law mandates certain conversations right so First of all, there are posting requirements with respect to leave rights, right? Then if an employer finds out that an employee is pregnant, they need to give that DFEH notice or the notice language that's out in the regs. And that's a good point to have the conversation to say, hey, here's a notice that talks about all of your rights, including ABC. If there's anything we can do, if there's anything you need, tell us, right? And, and I think that's a way of doing it without saying, oh, we're taking away these job duties of yours because we know it's going to be really hard for you to do them or, <laughs> you know, the, the things that employers do when they get it wrong. Um, there is one thing that I want to point out, which to me is like a little bit of an el the elephant in the room, which is six months of leave or seven months of leave is a long time and it's hard. And sometimes what I see is that employers are just distraught. The managers go, how are we going to make do? She's going to be out for four to six months. Why would I promote her right before her leave? Why would I do this? And it's a negative sentiment there. Or if the, if the, if the woman who's going out on a leave does such a good job that she has people cover for her and has, you know, colleagues slice and dice her work and everything, some employers go, oh, we're doing just fine without her. We don't really need her layoff of one. And I'll tell you that a huge chunk of my leave law cases are exactly that, that the, the, the person did such a great job preparing the employer for their, for their leave and covering and making sure that there's not a disruption to the business, that the company decides we're just fine without you. And that is almost always illegal, right? The reinstatement rights are very, very strong. Um, and one of the things that, you know, kind of is worth pointing out is when you're talking about pregnancy disability leave law and CIFRA, there are claims for interference and claims for retaliation. And interference is just, you didn't do employer the thing you were supposed to do, like let her come back to work when her leave time expired. And the onus is on the employer to prove if they eliminate that person's position that that would have happened even if that person had never gone out on a leave. And often, in these situations where they go, oh, we're just, we're just fine without you, that doesn't work. And I like to give the example that like at my old law firm, there were, you know, let's just say six administrative assistants who probably had about three administrative assistants worth of work to do between the six of them, right? And, um, you know, if someone had gone out on a leave, you probably wouldn't have noticed their absence because now there was, you know, like three people's worth of work to go between five people. But it would have been illegal to say, we're doing just fine without so-and-so, let's just eliminate her position, restructure, whatever it is, right? If an employer in that situation were to have that conclusion of like, oh, we're doing fine without this person, I think they really need to evaluate, A, would this have happened if, if not for this person's leave? And B, would they have been the one selected for layoff under these circumstances, right? Are you laying off the person who's on leave or the person who has less seniority, less productivity, less whatever it is? And this is a space that I spend a lot of time fighting in. And my guess is that Erica and Nora, you know, 
and Courtney also right that we live in this space of would that position really have been eliminated if this person hadn't taken a protective leave. I also just want to jump in and offer a few things that I have seen that I think are really helpful on this sort of culture side. Mm -hmm. So um, a few things I've seen employers do that I think are really helpful in terms of creating the dialogue and the sort of feeling of a culture of, we know that you have a life outside of this job. One of them being an off-ramp and an on-ramp. So, um, you know, a few weeks before your leave is going to start, your work is naturally sort of decreased because you, for example, you have no expectation to report to work. This is pre-pandemic. Like you can do more things remotely. There's no FaceTime requirement during that last sort of bump. And then when you return to work from your leave, you're returning sort of in a staged manner. So you're not showing up to work on the first day back from leave and you're already behind. Um, other things that I've seen that I've really liked is a mentor or um, a leave mentor or a leave coach. So some employers will pair a, a senior person who's gone through the process or went through the process a few years ago to sort of help guide that employee through the process be sort of the touch point in terms of like, how do I phrase this? Or what did you do in this circumstance? Or to kind of be the outside, almost like protector of, hey, if, if um, you have questions about the leave, um, we're not gonna stress out the employee, come talk to me and we'll make a plan. And making that sort of bridge in communication. Another thing that just seems really simple, but I think um, uh, can go a long way are gifts. I know that sounds silly, but um, if you go on maternity leave and you're taking all of this time off and you feel like your employer is celebrating that with you, a onesie, some flowers, congratulations. And then instead of it being, and obviously we have to be very careful with this because it can't be work-related. We don't want you to call people while they're on leave and ask them about anything related to their job duties. But if, for example, they contributed to something well before they went on leave that resulted in a big success, and the group is going out for drinks or to celebrate, it is okay to invite them. It is okay to make them part of a social aspect of work so long as it's completely removed from job duties. Um, and then the last thing is welcome them back with the same excitement. Um, so when it's time for them to return to work, send them a bottle of champagne, say welcome back, we can't wait to have you. Have a welcome back party. Um, things to sort of say, hey, you, you know, it's really difficult to return from leave if you have the kind of job that's free market, where you have to kind of go out to different supervisors and make sure that you're keeping yourself busy, like a law firm. Um, one thing that I've seen that's really successful is, hey, everybody, everybody in the group, so and so is coming back on this date, we're going to have a lunch together, or we're going to have a party to welcome them back. And then everybody at that table knows, oh, they're back, they're ready to work, and they're available to receive work. So there isn't some sort of miscommunication or, um, or sort of lost sense of like, when did they come back? Are they really back? Especially in the remote um, world, even in remote, I mean, no one's really doing Zoom happy hours anymore, but some sort of way to get the employees together, supervisors and managers, and to recognize, oh, this person is now back. We're so excited to have them. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. One is, what advice would you give employers who employ, a who employ pregnant workers in occupations that could be hazardous to a fetus? Um, well, one thing that um, is you could do, there's a field occupational medicine where that can make a evaluation of the job setting and how that is, that can affect the fetus specifically and maybe relocate the person for that time being during the pregnancy or, um, um, you know, whether it's, if it's, for example, something that um, can expose uh, the fetus during um, first trimester, maybe there'll be a move in that time period, but occupational medicine is a great referral source to make a full evaluation. I think it's also important, like we've been talking about, to keep that open line of communication and really just look at the position that, you know, when someone announces that they're pregnant and what, what do they do? Um, and this goes a lot for um, people that tend to work in manufacturing or anything like that. You just evaluate, well, what is this person doing? What are the job requirements? And is there some place else for the time being uh, that this person could work in? And it is never, you know, a, a bad response to, 
just have that open communication, uh, which is what I tell my clients all the time. You know, if they're confused about something, don't guess, you know, invite a conversation. Like, don't, don't make assumptions also. Uh, it's best to communicate. I think that's that's a, a, a kind of a life aspiration as well, but it is perfect in when you talk about accommodations, when you talk about engaging in the interactive process. So for example, you know, somebody's working in a hazardous, um, you know, around paint, Courtney brought that up. You might be able to look at, maybe there's an office position they can right. work at for a while so they're not near the paint. So there, there's, that's what's required as you kind of go through that interactive process and see what kind of accommodations might work. And let's say there are no accommodations. It's an essential function of the job and there isn't another job you could, because you're not required to create a job. Uh, what would you suggest then? It's like a further, I mean, you evaluate that, right? What is it, that that goes with evaluating what is the essential function of the job? And yes, you're right. The employer is not required to create another position. But I would say my advice would always be, well, is there something temporary that that this particular employee could do? Uh, because we we know uh, that she is pregnant uh, and that, you know, she probably needs an accommodation or, or could need an accommodation. So what can we do in that circumstance to provide for that? Because it, it is, you know, for a temporary time period. <laughs> I think that a lot of the clients that come to me just as an, an overarching theme is feeling like they come because they feel like to Nora's point that they, they don't feel like they're welcome anymore. So I think there's, that's one aspect of it. And they also feel like their employer has made zero effort in order to help them. So I think to Erica's point, you know, constant communication is really important when they're like Nora said, when they tell their employer that they're pregnant, being welcomed with that news. Oh my God, that's great. As opposed to like, wow, when you're going out on a leave, okay, what do you need? You know, and that, that, that welcome, um, that feeling of feeling welcome, I think really sets the tone of the open line of communication, like Erica is saying. And that, and I think at that point, if there is there, if there is a point where there's an impasse where there's no job for the employee, you know, and, and there's no temporary job that the employee is able to do, you know, if that, if that employer is willing to entertain that type of an option, I think if, I think oftentimes the employee might feel at that point, like, like everything was done. And if they, if they feel like everything was done, they won't be calling a lawyer. They won't be upset more likely than not. They're going to, they're going to walk away with a better feeling than some of my clients who come to me who feel like nothing was done. I told them that I was pregnant. They stopped talking to me. I told them to remove me from the paint. They said that there's no other job. They said it by letter and they basically sent me my last check and that was it. You know, and it's those scenarios that we're trying to avoid. And I think that communication really will help with. And, I, and just to build on what Courtney is saying, I see a lot of it too on the other side of the pregnancy. The baby's arrived, mom is back at work, and suddenly employers are horrific on lactation accommodations. They're asking her to pump in a bathroom. That's against the law. They're not giving her time to pump. That's against the law, um, right? They're, they're not giving her access to a fridge or a sink. That's against the law, um, you know, with limited uh, exceptions for, uh, you know, for, for, for smaller employers on the, you know, the private space. Um, and, and I've had a lot of clients whose milk supply disappears simply because their employers are not giving them the lactation accommodations that they need. Um, and, you know, you've got your kind of separate labor co code claims related to that, but it really is under the PDL accommodation obligations, part of those claims. And for a lot of women, right, the emotional distress that comes with the loss of their milk supply is tremendous, right? It's not fun or easy to pump <laughs> for a lot of new mothers. It can be really hard. And, um, and actually, I didn't know this until I became a mother, but, um, you know, milk lactation is, you're not like a cow with like a machine with the udders, right? Like it's like a letdown is, is a psychological thing. Um, and so a mom away from her baby who's trying to pump, if she is feeling anxiety and nerves, the milk just will not come out for them sometimes. Um, and so I think that it's also really important for employers to understand that these accommodation obligations really do continue after mom comes back to work, especially in those early months, 
um, you know, when she's trying to, for, for those who are some just, it doesn't work for them or they don't want to, but for those who are trying to do it, um, to, to make sure that they have the environment, right? Put them in a room with a door that locks. Don't put them in a fishbowl conference room. I swear to God, I had a client who was asked to pump in a conference room that was all glass. Um, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> I've had those cases too. I've had those cases too, where they're asked to pump in an, in an office that has, you know, that's a, just a fully glass office or something like that. And I think to build off of what Ramit was saying, I, I think the emotional distress related to women whose milk supplies dry, dry up prematurely, or they give up on pumping or they give up on breastfeeding their child because they just can't make it work, you know, because of their schedule in the workplace. That is something that's happened that is longstanding. It affects them for a very long time. Some people don't get over it. It affects the way that they feel about a mother, the, it, the way that they feel like they were bonded with their child, how they feel like they um, took care of their their child, the quality of, of the job that they're doing as a mother, which even though obviously that it's, it's not real, but all of the, all of those feelings and how they affect the postpartum depression and, every, and, and everything like that, it kind of gets mixed up. And I think that the employer doesn't even realize how they are affecting this woman for a very long time and in a lot of different ways. And I think that's really important. Something that's not even realized. They think, well, they just, they they can go pump in the bathroom, you know, just, or, or go pump in this office. And if they, they can't pump anymore. Okay. They're not, they're just, they can't do it. It is what it is, but these things have a really, a really tremendous effect. So I want to switch gears for a minute and talk a little bit about trying these cases. Cause obviously not every case that is brought um, uh, gets litigated and tried to, uh, and, and there is in fact discrimination. So interestingly, Erica and Courtney were opposing counsel in a case. Uh, Courtney then left before the trial started, I believe. Um, but Erica, I know you defense the pregnancy discrimination case. So I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the cases that are brought um, and Ramin, I know you recently tried a couple of pregnancy discrimination cases. So just thought we could chat a little bit about um, uh, the difficulties in trying these cases, both from the defense perspective and then uh, from the plaintiff side. Well, from the defense perspective, I mean, I, I don't think I'd be the only person to say I, I, they're not easy. Uh, I think pregnancy discrimination cases are very difficult. Uh, I think they're entirely sympathetic. Um, they probably wouldn't be my first choice in, in picking a case to try, uh, but I think in this particular, this particular case, I think, you know, to, to be frank, I, I think that it was a defensible case because it became less about the pregnancy discrimination as the trial went on, because this certain set of facts was that essentially, in a nutshell, um, there was ample evidence, I think, that the employer did not know that the plaintiff was pregnant. Uh, and so it was able to show that there were legitimate reasons for her termination outside her pregnancy. And so it wasn't a lot of focus on that. And, and at the time plaintiff was terminated, um, she wasn't visibly pregnant. I think she was only like very early on in her first trimester. So it wasn't a lot about the pregnancy. The case as tried was really kind of a, a, a retaliation. I think a kind of like a gender discrimination case. So really it wasn't focused on that. And that was probably, you know, a benefit. And um, I think that they are, are very difficult to try uh, because you garner sympathy. And if you have particular comments directed at women because they're pregnant or because of their inability to work because of that, you have a double layer of hurdles that you have to go through. Um, I think as an employer though, one of the things that, I look for if it is a pregnancy discrimination case is, and we talked a bit about this in the beginning about the law, is the woman disabled by her pregnancy? And that, that's a key thing. The woman has to be disabled by that, not just I'm pregnant. Um, and it was something that I, I was able to get summary judgment on in a recent case because there was no showing that the particular plaintiff was disabled by her pregnancy. She had admitted that she can do all her job. She, I think, made mention that, you know, it was a high risk pregnancy, but that was it. She was able to perform the essential functions of her job. And so there was no competing evidence to show here that there was any disability related to the pregnancy. Um, but 
you know, Courtney can offer a different perspective, but I will say, you know, I, I, that was the only reason I think it was defense. It wasn't particularly, uh, it was, it was essentially because it wasn't focused on her pregnancy. I, you know, I, to be honest with you, I think Erica has a much better memory of that case and what occurred, but I think to Erica's point, what's very important on the plaintiff's side is us clarifying the timing of events in a lot of these cases. Okay. What happened? first, second, third, when did you notify your employee of your pregnancy? Were you disabled at that time? Did you ask for any sort of accommodations? You know, if so, what were they? What did they say? And I think that that's really something that's critical. And where in that case, I don't, I don't have as great of a recollection as Erica, but I know that the case was defense. And if she's saying that it wasn't because, you know, the pregnancy was focused on, I know that as we litigated that case, that was something that was a part of the focus, whether that was the strategy at trial and the reasons, you know, that it went that way, I'm not really sure, but I do know that clarifying the time, the timing of notifying your employer of their, of, of the, of the pregnancy is obviously very important and something that can make a huge difference in a trial. And I agree. I, I think, uh, the plaintiff potentially has the edge going for them in some in some perspective because you've got a, a hopefully a you know a, or you have a pregnant woman or someone who used to be pregnant. But I think that there's also the viewpoint that well maybe they you know if there's if um, poor performance is argued then jurors might feel well you know maybe they weren't really performing their you know the the their job as well as they were before and that might taint the jurors view not realizing the protections under the law. So I think that there's a whole, it can go either way. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of my perspective on that. And Ramit, Ramit, I know you tried one and you won, and then you had another one that didn't go so well. So just not done yet. TBD. Ah. <laughs> okay. It's my long missive, it's still active, but um, I had a pregnancy case that went to trial a few years back. Um, and, you know, it, it had a bunch of the different causes of action, right? There was a FIHA pregnancy discrimination component. There was a PDL interference and retaliation component, wrongful termination. Basically, my client worked in a job where, actually for a fertility doctor, um, where they needed her for a procedure. And she had bleeding and wasn't able to come into work. And they were really ticked off because they couldn't do what they needed to do without her. Um, and, you know, after that, she didn't last much longer, and they ended up firing her for alleged performance issues. Um, but, you know, you also see, I, I will say that sometimes there's something where the, the employee can say, oh, yes, I have bleeding, I went to the doctor, and there might be a note, but they might also say, I was vomiting all morning. And they might not have a doctor's note for that, because they were vomiting at home all morning. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I would say whenever you have pregnancy or disability related claims, just be careful about having like a slavish commitment to getting a doctor's note, because there may be times where that may not be practical at that moment. Similarly, right, with the with pregnancy leave, right, the employee is supposed to give 30 days notice if the leave is foreseeable, but, you know, give notice as soon as is practicable if it's not. So again, a person may not know that they're going to wake up with morning sickness, just like a person may not know that they're going to wake up with a migraine if they have migraines. Um, that being the case, if someone has some, you know, surgical procedure that they need a person for, they might be really upset that that person didn't show up for work, but they have to live with that because the law is very clear <laughs> that there's, you know, under PDL, right, if the person needs the time, they get it. Under CIFRA 2, we've eliminated the key employee, um, you know, kind of hardship exemption that used to live in the CIFRA that still lives in FMLA. That's why I say who cares about the FMLA. Um, but, you know, there are certain rights that employees have. Employers don't like it. And that's why I end up seeing those cases, because the law may say one thing, but employers may not like it and respond. So, you know, in, in that case, yay, we prevailed. Um, I have another case, it's still pending, so I, I told Eve I wouldn't say a lot about it, other than to say, um, you know, my client was told uh, by her female manager who had four kids of her own, after she told her she was pregnant, you're just emotional because you're pregnant, you're emotional because you're pregnant, you can't do this because you're pregnant, you can't do that because you're pregnant, and it was really distressing to my client because maybe her manager was emotional when her manager was pregnant, and maybe her manager couldn't do stuff when her manager was pregnant, but my client disagreed with that and was really offended by that sort of treatment. So we'll see how that comes out, but 
we have anyway. a que yeah. Sorry, we have a question from the audience. Um, we have a couple. So real quick, um, would you advise an employer to hold off on terminating an employee for what in the employer says are performance issues if the employee is pregnant, knowing full well that a life lawsuit might follow? So that's one question and another question. I'm gonna throw them out and then you guys can answer because I know we're running out of time. Another question is, um, in trying these cases, do you think it's better to have a female litigator uh, to garner more sympathy from the jury than a male litigator? That's probably on the defense side. Um, and then the last question um, was, is there some source that you can point um, people to, to talk about the emotional distress component of a pregnancy discrimination, harassment, or retaliation case? I'll just say, get a female defense lawyer and she should wear a pregnant belly prosthesis for extra. <laughs> I think a female litigator is always better, but I'm biased. There, um, I would agree with you 100%. I was going to say, either way, it's always a female defense attorney. <laughs> um, so I think for the first question, we obviously don't have context, but um, and to points that were made earlier, when I advise clients on what to do because they are in a situation either where they don't know um, how to accommodate an employee or they're being very focused on what exactly the note says, the overarching advice that I try to give is do and say things you will be proud of later. So do things like, okay, so maybe the note has um, the, the medical restriction, technically, technically, the restriction ended, but she's still pregnant. Do you think maybe you should talk to her and see if you need an updated note instead of just saying, nope, according to the note, she doesn't need this accommodation anymore. Um, what are you really communicating to other employees if you treat one employee differently? Or what is the ripple effect in your culture if someone is has announced their pregnancy and is then terminated? If you're going to terminate a pregnant employee, you need to make sure that it's not a surprise to the employee that it's documented in performance reviews, uh, critical feedback, that it's unrelated to the pregnancy in every circumstance, and that you're going to be proud of this termination later. Um, I, I cannot, you know, off the top, give you legal advice, of course, but I also can't, without the full context information, tell you what to do other than do and say things you'll be proud of later. Um, as far as, you know, who's better at garnering sympathy from a jury, I mean, I think both uh, sexes can be equally, uh, I mean, there's really no benefit per se. I just find that um, in the employment arena, female litigators tend to see things from a full spectrum um, and are able to have a more 360 degree approach in terms of particularly the emotional impact and how to speak to um, the plaintiff who's making these allegations in a way that doesn't alienate the jury. And what about resources for uh, the emotional distress component of these claims? So I don't know, Mandana, if you know anything. Oh, a, yeah, uh, a great resource is the American Psychiatric Association, not Psychological, Psychiatric Association. And um, um, there is a section for uh, patients and families, and they have really great, um, on every topic, educating you on um, yeah, any, any symptom, but there is a perinatal or a postpartum depression section there. All right, before we conclude, is there anything else um, anybody is dying to share um, on this topic, particularly again about elimination of bias, how we can educate people just, you know, before out of the employment context, because to me, this starts way before you become in a position of power and management. Um, it, it starts with stereotypes and biases and that everybody has. I mean, and it doesn't seem to have changed dramatically from when I first started as a young lawyer many years ago uh, to where we are now. It's, it's a lot, it, it's better, but a lot of the same things, themes I hear over and over and over and over that I heard back in the 80s. 
Well, I guess I would say this. Um, for most of the people that are hearing this presentation, we have the privilege of having many choices we get to make in our lives, right? We can often choose the firm we work for or where we work. We can choose, right, the, the you know, we can choose our partners, right? There are so many, you know, like, when we think about change, as I was saying, you can think about it at the individual level, at the entity level, at the policy level, at the societal level. There are, there's been a lot of work on the legislative side, on the policy side, that change tends to be a lot slower. It's easier to implement change in our own lives, although we have a lot more, you know, we have less control over the things that are beyond our reach. But, you know, even things like picking the right partner to make sure that there's a more egalitarian division of labor in the family, choosing a firm to work for that has family-friendly policies and values women in positions of authority, right? Like if you look at a big law firm's top leadership, are they all men? That's not gonna bode well for other things within that firm as opposed to ones which have more women as partners um, and you know, choose wisely. And even the stereotypes, I think if women are educated about the stereotypes, that, that in itself can empower them in understanding how to address that conversation. Um, for example, um, I'm, I'll have someone watching my child when I return to work. I'll be available when my child is you know, sick. I don't know if a mom chooses to do that, but um, having knowing that the that the assumption in the workforce is that you are not going to be committed, you're not going to be available. And maybe when you go into that meeting, um, before you take maternity leave, you make those things clear. Understanding that this is a, this is an assumption that you're that one is going to make about you when you take leave, or have a child. I, I agree with what Ramit said, you know, I mean, from the perspective of, of course, choosing a partner that's going to be more involved. But I think in the workplace, if it becomes more socially acceptable that men are more involved with their children, then it's not, then, you know, if, if a man goes, he has to go pick up his kids from school, then it's not always the expectation that, okay, oh, this woman, she's going to have a kid and then she's going to be, you know, she's going to have to come in late because she's got to drop her kid off at daycare. And then she's going to have to leave early because she's got to, because the kid's out of school at three 30. If the expectation is not that the woman is responsible for doing everything in the household and that there's more of an equal division of labor, then a pregnancy is not going to be, you know, considered something that's as an, as much of as, as a negative, because they're going to think, okay, well, she's having the baby, but you know, maybe, maybe it'll be an easy pregnancy and she'll be here before, you know, two days before she gives birth. And then after that, her husband's going to take care of the kid and she'll be back at work. I mean, cause in reality, we're, our society is moving more in that direction. I know a lot of women that give birth and then their husband ends up staying home for a longer period of time. And they end up going back to work because for whatever reason, you know, it, that's the decision that they've, that they've made within their family. So I think if there's more of a division of labor in the household and there's more of an acceptance in the workplace that men are able to take time off related to their, either their wife's pregnancy or a new child, or just, or even to take care of their children as they get older, I think it'll just, it kind of has this backwards effect where it starts to make it easier so that when a woman is notifies their employer that they're pregnant, it's not seen as something that's going to completely kill her career and her time there. And we are entering a societal shift, right? 60% of college grads are now women. Um, that is going to get closer to two thirds within a handful of years. And so we are going to see women rising up within the ranks of a lot of uh, professional spaces where they've been underrepresented. And I think that that will lead to other shifts that, that are going to um, make things better. Well, on that happy note, um, one of the things that I think is also really important is mentoring. And letting younger women know that it's okay to speak up, letting men know that, hey, these are the issues that pregnant women face. So education and all those things. Um, and those are some of the other programs that back full, going full circle that we at the Committee on Empowering Women like to focus on. So I wanna thank everybody for attending our presentation today. And I hope you will look out for some of our future events. So we have more networking ones as well, which are a lot of fun. So thank you so much. And we are gonna make the PowerPoint available. I think it's gonna be distributed right after we close the program. And thank you so much, everybody on the panel as well. Have a good evening. Bye, thank you.